The Lorica Segmentata is one of the most well-known forms of armor in the Western world, and it is probably the most iconic form of armor that comes to mind when people think about the Romans. The earliest date we have, right now anyway, for the appearance of this armor is 9 BCE. Maybe. But definitely by 9 CE, and it was utilized by the Roman legions from that date until some point in the 4th century. I want to point out though, that dates are always changing as we acquire more evidence, so take those start and end years with a grain of salt. They could always change, and they probably eventually will. So before we get into the nuts and bolts of this armor, we have to understand the limitations of the evidence for Lorica Segmentata. Archaeological expeditions and digs are expensive endeavors. There isn't actually as much archaeology done on various topics as you might at first think. We're going to come back to this in a second, but I wanted to throw that out there so it can frame our overall discussion of the evidence. The vast majority of the evidence for the Lorica Segmentata, actually, for a lot of armor and weapons from Roman times, is artistic. And the main pieces of artistic evidence are the celebratory columns of Antoninus Pius, Marcus Aurelius, the Arch of Constantine, the Arch of Severus, and, most famously, the Column of Trajan. We're going to focus on this one because of that fame. Now, I'm going to show you an image from this column, and I pray to Zeus that it falls under fair use. And what I want you to notice is that all the legionaries are wearing Lorica Segmentata. Notice I said legionaries. This is a really, really important detail here, because in other sections of the column, it shows auxiliary troops wearing mail, not Lorica Segmentata. And that has been interpreted to mean that only legionaries wore this armor. That's an example of what to watch out for when interpreting this stuff. Just because Trajan's column shows legionaries wearing Lorica Segmentata doesn't mean that it was exclusively worn by them. The artist who created this, actually the artist who created many of these things, because this is not the only place it shows up, could have just differentiated the armor in order to distinguish between legionaries and auxiliary troops. This actually makes more sense once we look at funeral stelae and other gravestones, most of which just depict troops wearing mail. So you see the problem here. Just because a piece of art shows everyone wearing a certain form of armor doesn't necessarily mean that they did. With these limitations in mind, now we can turn to the hard stuff, the archaeological evidence. I mentioned before that archaeological digs are expensive to fund, and this limits the amount of digs that are actually done. As archaeological remains are usually buried, the main limitation on this evidence, besides the funding thing, is that organic materials aren't going to survive, generally speaking. Well, actually they can, but we'll talk about that later on. In the context of armor, this means things generally made out of leather, but depending on the acidity of the soil and other factors, inorganic materials can also be lost. And in the context of armor, this means metal. So, that being said, what does the archaeology give us in the way of Lorica Segmentata? Well, according to archaeology, Lorica Segmentata can be classified into three types. The Calcris type, the Corbridge type, and the Newstead type. The armor undergoes, or appears to undergo, changes in design and general craft styles as the centuries wore on, which is why it's broken into these three broad categories. They have issues, but we'll get to that as the video progresses. Before we keep going though, here's a timeline of the styles, but please understand that the dates are approximate and based on what we know right now from archaeology. And of course, I gotta give a shout out to my favorite ruler. The land that comprises modern day Austria was, to the Romans, known as Noricum, and in terms of archaeological discoveries, the Austrian finds are the first pieces of Lorica that we've turned up, as they were discovered in 1901, and although the pieces were far from complete, again, stuff corrodes and decomposes, there was quite a lot of it. Not surprising since Noricum was on the Roman frontier. However, the earliest remains of Lorica Segmentata don't come from here. The earliest remains in terms of production come from a very famous, or perhaps a very infamous, battlefield. The Roman world was divided into a few different categories, but the northern portions of that world were divided into the Roman Empire and Barbaricum, the land of the barbarians. It's a loaded term, and barbarian meant different things to different people depending on what exactly was being talked about, but Rome had a policy with the border groups, whereby Rome would essentially bring them into its sphere of influence. In 9 CE though, several of the tribes banded together to decimate three legions at the Battle of the Teutoburg Wald, otherwise known as the Battle of Teutoburg Forest. The most recent data puts the battle near Calcris Hill, and thus the armor excavated there is known as the Calcris type. Of all the stuff excavated at Calcris, one of the most important is the left breastplate of Alorica Segmentata. The piece is 188mm in length and 135mm in width, with a thickness that varies between 1 and 3mm depending on what part is being examined. And, by the way, you'll notice I said 1 to 3mm. The armor is not overly thick, and thus not extremely heavy. You have to keep in mind that people were meant to move in this stuff. This left breastplate also shows some evidence of a bronze edging on the neck, 
but why this is there is not entirely certain. I also mentioned earlier that sometimes organic materials can survive, and this is one of those instances where it does. The breastplate has two leather straps that were mineralized, and thus preserved. And good thing too, because we can see how they were attached to the plate. The Romans used copper rivets. Well, specifically, they used a form of copper alloy that they called orichalcum. Yeah, that's right, Elder Scrolls people, it's real. The Calcris archaeology does not provide us with any backplates, but a site in the United Kingdom, the Chichester site. For any Brits listening to this, I probably butchered that, and I'm sorry. Anyway, this site dates to the mid-40s CE, and it's close enough in time to the Battle of Teutoburg Forest for us to link the Lorica remains there to the Lorica remains found in the UK. So, what does this new site tell us? Well, the Lorica remains found in the UK are three pieces of a mid-collar plate, a back plate, and a shoulder guard. The mid-collar plates are twice as thick than the breastplate excavated at Calcris, so between 2 and 6 millimeters, and it doesn't have that bronze edging, which maybe suggests that the Calcris breastplate had it for reinforcement. I can't comment on the back plate because I'm not able to get access to that field report, sorry guys, but I can tell you about the shoulder piece. The shoulder guard excavated here is remarkable because it is almost entirely intact, and it's one single strip of metal. Because it is one strip, it fits onto the Calcris breastplate rather nicely, and therefore it's been argued that these remains belong to the Calcris type. Not everybody would agree with that, for some extremely technical reasons I don't feel qualified to get into. I'm a historian, not an archaeologist, but that's just food for thought. You should bear in mind though that these excavations in the UK could depict a transitional form of Lorica segmentata. Now we're going to leave the Calcris armor for now, and move on to the core bridge type. There's obviously quite a lot more to say, but it's going to require a video strictly on the Calcris armor. I'll do it eventually once I get access to more of those field reports. In July of 1964, archaeologists were continuing fieldwork on the Roman site of Corbridge when a chest was uncovered. Upon further excavation, it was determined that the chest had been buried under the floorboards of whatever building it had been taken into, and the building then burned down. The archaeologists stated the pieces of armor discovered inside this chest to between 86 and 105 CE. Later on, though, the notion that the building burned with the chest inside of it was challenged, and it was suggested that the chest was buried within the remains of a building that had already burned. Because hoards, the archaeological term for large deposits of wealth or goods, were more common in the Roman sites during the 2nd century, it was then suggested that the armor inside the chest should be dated to between 122 and 138 CE. The dating of what became known as the Corbridge type is problematic because of the issues in interpreting the archaeological record, like when the chest was deposited. But, the Corbridge type pieces show that extensive repairs had been done to them over time, and certain remains look like they're made up of random parts of other pieces, so this could potentially be an older style of Lorica segmentata that was repaired over the decades. The official field report for the Corbridge Horde is about 150 pages long and has a lot of issues with the photographs taken of the artifacts. Attempts to reconstruct the Corbridge Loricas have generally been met with mixed results, and it's been assumed that the archaeologists who excavated the artifacts originally photographed and drew them in the incorrect way. However, there are those who would say, they were photographed in the correct way. We don't really know. Experts fight about how certain pieces should be arranged and where they should fit, and it's even more problematic because we only have bits and pieces of this stuff, not full sets. The Corbridge type is subdivided into type A and type B, but even these subdivisions are fought over. So what you want to keep in mind here is that modern replicas of Lorica Segmentata will never be 100% historically accurate. That's like an end goal that we strive to, but we simply don't have the evidence to fully recreate it, and the experts fight continuously about what goes where. The last main type is the Newstead type, and the first pieces of it were discovered at the Roman fort at Newstead during the excavations carried out between 1905 and 1906. The fort was abandoned during the Antonine period, but further excavations have turned up similar looking pieces at other sites from the mid-3rd century, especially at Zrugmantel, the remains of a Roman fort along the central European frontier. Like the other types, there was a ton to say about the Newstead, but unlike the others, the remains of what we discovered are extremely fragmentary. So what I'm going to do here is leave the discussion of Newstead, and we'll go into more depth with field reports in a dedicated video. Now, since we don't have tons of archaeological evidence, and due to this, the reconstructions are problematic, what can we say about how effective this was if we can say anything at all? Well, when creating reconstructions, we need to understand that we are using modern materials. Chemically cured leather, not leather cured with decomposing vegetable matter or lye, modern steel, modern copper, not orichalcum. We use sheet metal in modern reconstructions, whereas, from what we can tell, Roman armor was forged to fit individual bodies. 
Well, Lorica Segmentata was, anyway. The remains excavated are fragile, so there hasn't been much metallurgical research done on them. The work of people like David Sim notwithstanding, and even if there was, even if we tried, we probably would not be able to get iron, or steel, or bronze, made to the exact specifications that the Romans would have employed, and we certainly cannot recreate or recalcum. With that in mind, testing replicas for effectiveness is useful, but we have to realize that modern materials are used in its construction when doing that testing. Lorica Segmentata holds up very well against blows from edged weapons. We also have the protectiveness against edged weapons attested in primary sources. In Julius Caesar's Gallic Wars, we can read at length in multiple instances in which his troops were devastated by edged weapons. Lorica Segmentata, as far as we can tell, was not around. But, a few decades later, the casualty descriptions in primary sources don't show up as much. Now this can be omitted by authors in an attempt to make the legions look good, but given that descriptions of these armors are cropping up more and more frequently, it's relatively safe to make the assumption that the descriptions of Roman casualties due to edged weapons decreases because their armor becomes more effective. As always, there's more we can get into, and we're going to. But I wanted this video to serve as an introduction to the armor, and the issues in using the sources. I'm going to end this now, and if you have any questions or comments, as usual, you know where to find me.